We talked about this in language arts today, so you have a general idea of what's going to go on. We have 10 different books for you today, and various people are going to talk about different books. We're going to read you a, a, probably a small section of the book, give you an idea of what the book is about. And when we're done book talking those 10 books, you're going to get to choose one to sign out. This is a book that you'll be reading both for language arts and science. And on Monday, Mr. D and I will be meeting with you and talking about what you're going to do after you finish the book. All right? Any questions before we start? Okay, there are some of the books that are over here that you're going to sign out over here. Most of them are at checkout with the library, they're over by Mr. D. But some of them are over here. And after we go through all the book talks, we'll go through where you're going to find the books and also a way to get the books to you so it's not um, complete hysteria. Okay. I'm starting with the book Mockingbird. This is a book that was added two years ago? Yeah. Two years ago. This is by Katherine Erskine. I heard you had a TRM at school today, Dad says. I stared at the covered chest in the corner. TRM, I say. Hmm. That reminds me. He means tantrum, rage, meltdown. But I don't want to talk about it. He sighs. Caitlin, honey, my finger hurt, I say. That's why. I think it was more than your finger. Also, I bumped my, ha my head on the table during the TR when my finger hurt. So it was my finger and my head, both. That's two things. I continue counting in my head. Three, four, five, six. I hear Dad's voice, but I focus on counting. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and thinking about stuffed animals. And I want red dogs, so I get up and walk down the hall to my room, which is thirteen and a half steps. More if you take little tiptoe steps, so you don't step on any of the seams in the wood. I look across at Devin's room and wish, wish, wish I could go in, but I know I can't. I hear Dad saying my name, but he's in another world right now. Twenty-one, twenty-two. 23, 24. I push my door open and wade through the clothes and books and papers and pencils and yarn and stickers on my floor and go to my bed where there are 153 stuffed animals, including keychains and McDonald's Happy Meal toys. But the one I want is Red Dog, and he is sleeping under the bed with my purple fleece blanket because Dad is too loud. 37, 38, 39. And I get under the blanket with Red Dog and we go to sleep while I'm still counting. This is a story of Caitlin. Caitlin has Asperger's syndrome, which is a form of autism. And Caitlin has lost her brother. Her brother has died. And she's trying very hard to manage her world. Her brother has always helped her. Devin's always been there to help her get through. And now Devin's not there anymore. And Caitlin has to manage her world with Asperger's syndrome and a lot of confusing noises and events that go on in the world. So this is Caitlin's story. And if you're interested in reading about Caitlin, you're going to choose Mockingbird. Oh, Al Capone. That's me. That's me. Hi, you guys. I'm Mrs. Schettinger. And I want to share with you today this great story called Al Capone Does My Shirts. You might know Al Capone as a real life gangster. He really lived in Chicago, and he really did get sent to prison on Alcatraz. You guys may have heard of Alcatraz um, off the coast of uh, San Francisco. And the great thing about this book is that it, it, it's set on Alcatraz, and there's a map here. Um, another great thing is the author's note at the back of the book. Um, an author's um, explanation of the story because in real life, the author Jennifer Cheldenko in real life grew up with a sister who had um, autism. 
And back in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, kid, doctors and families didn't know how to treat autism. And so uh, this family moved to another town for a school that was special for kids with autism. And it turns out that the father uh, worked on Alcatraz. And it's the brother who tells the story. And I want to share with you the opening of Al Capone Does My Shirts um, for you. When I found this book, I thought, oh, it's going to be about Al Capone. That's going to be great. And then I realized reading it that it was on Alcatraz. And I thought, oh, it's going to be about Alcatraz. This is going to be great. It's going to be Al Capone on Alcatraz. I was not totally right. It really is, overall, a story about autism. But this is how it starts. Chapter 1 is called Devil's Island, Friday, January 4th, 1935. Today, I moved to a 12-acre rock covered with cement, topped with bird turd, and surrounded by water. Alcatraz sits smack in the middle of the bay, so close to the city of San Francisco, I can hear them call the score on a baseball game on Marina Green. Okay, not that close, but still. I'm not the only kid who lives here. There's my sister, Natalie, except she doesn't count. And there are 23 other kids who live on the island because their dads work as guards or cooks or doctors or electricians for the prison like my dad does. Plus, there are a ton of murderers, hit men, con men, stick up men, embezzlers, connivers, burglars, kidnappers, and maybe even an innocent man or two, though I doubt it. The convicts we have here are the kind other prisons don't want. I never knew prisons could be picky, but I guess they can. You get to Alcatraz by being the worst of the worst, unless you're me. I came here because my mother said I had to. It's a very funny book dealing with a very serious issue. Al Capone does my shirts. Okay, who's next? Uh, this is The Eleventh Plague by an author named Jeff Hirsch. And uh, this story follows the life of a uh, 15-year-old boy named Stephen and his father Mr. as they, am I on? All right, I'll stand. There you go. There we go. I'll stay right here. As they make their way through a, an America of the future, an America that has uh, been invaded by a foreign country. There's been a war in the United States, devastated the population. Uh, following that was this awful outbreak of a flu virus, the influenza. And that's really the science component of the novel. But it follows this boy and his father as they try to make their way through a very hostile, unfriendly world in America that obviously is not what we know it is, as it is today. And uh, there's uh, obviously pockets of people throughout the country. We could label them the good guys, people who want to try to reestablish something, some kind of America, develop communities and try and reestablish what things were. And then some folks you could label the bad guys who are out there to continue to wreak havoc and prey upon other people. And so it's this very unfriendly, hostile world. You know, I'll read you a short, short bit here. Um, I brought my rifle over the lip of the outcropping. Icy sweat was pouring down my face and arms. The leader of the slavers set his gun down and reached out toward Dad. I had his back squarely in my sights, but I was paralyzed, too afraid, too uncertain to act. I was seven years old again, on my knees before the great brown bulk of that bear, waiting for someone to appear and to make it all go away. Shots came from my left, over where the other two had ducked into the shadows. One bullet struck the wall behind me, sending a rain of gravel down over my head. The other slammed into the dirt in front of me, and I dropped down behind the rock. Jackson, no. I raised the rifle just as someone came out of the darkness downstream, running to the man on the ground, a rifle in his hand. I leveled the scope. His face was round, unlined, beardless, and framed in a tangle of reddish curls. The ground beneath me pulled away, and I went icy inside. My God, he's younger than me. Sand crunched behind me. I spun around, and the last thing I saw was the wooden stock of a rifle flying toward the side of my head. There we go. 
So uh, lots of action adventure, a wee little bit of romance, I'll say, but it's a good book. And uh, I go a wee little bit, right? And it'll keep you, it'll keep you, you know, on the edge of your seat till the very end. So the 11th plane. So. Okay. This is uh, Fever, 1793. It's a story of Manny Cook, a young girl who lives above a coffee shop with her mother. It's the family coffee shop. And uh, then what happens is yellow fever hits Philadelphia and 10% of the city is wiped out. And she tries to escape with her grandfather, but then she realizes there's nowhere to run. And it's a pretty intriguing story, and it falls right in place with where we are right now in history class. I'm here, mother, I whispered. Be still. She shook her head from side to side on the pillow. Tears threatened again. I sniffed and tried to control my face. No one could ever tell that mother thought or felt by looking at her. This was a useful trait. I needed to learn how to do it. There were so many things she had tried to teach me, but I didn't listen. I leaned over to kiss her forehead. A tear slipped out before I could stop it. I quietly sat beside her and opened my psalm book, praying for deliverance, or at least the dawn. I must have dozed off. One moment the room was still, the next mother flew off the pillow and was violently ill, vomiting blood all over the bed and the floor. Her eyes rolled back in her head. I jumped up from the stool. Eliza, I screamed, help. There was no answer. Eliza was gone. I was alone. I forced myself back to the bed. Mother panted heavily. Everything will be fine, I said as I sponged her face clean. Just lay still. Her eyes opened and I smiled at her. Tears pooled in her eyes and spilled down her cheeks. She opened her cracked lips. Go away, she whispered. Run. Leave me. I recoiled as she leaned over the bed and retched a foul-smelling black liquid onto the floor. Oh, stop, please stop, I begged. Leave me, mother shouted in a ragged voice. Leave me, run away now. Fever, 1793, if you're interested. Hi guys, I'm gonna talk to you today about a mango-shaped space. And this is about a girl your age who has a condition called synesthesia, where she sees letters and sounds and words in numbers in color, and they have shape. And so I'm going to read you an excerpt today from the book, When, she, when Mia Comes to the Realization that She Sees Things Quite Differently from the Other Kids Her Age, which she never realized before. Free. I'll never forget the first time I heard the word that day at the blackboard. It was five years ago when I was eight. For those who are mathematically challenged like me, that means I'm 13 now. So there I was. My mission was to multiply 24 times 9. I remember thinking that if I wrote slowly enough, the bell might ring before I could finish. Just five more minutes. Then, then no one would know that I couldn't solve the problem. I rolled the smooth piece of chalk around my fingers and tried to think about the whole class staring at my back, glancing around in what I hoped looked like intense concentration. <clears throat> I noticed a few fragments of colored chalk on the ledge of the board. To use up some time, I put down the white piece and began rewriting each letter on the board in its correct color. Mia, my teacher, Mrs. Lowe, startled me. As I turned, the chalk screeched on the board and a deep red zigzag shape sped across my field of vision. My classmates groaned at the noise. This isn't art class, she said, wagging her long finger at me. Just use the white chalk. But isn't it better to use the right colors, I added, confident that the kids would agree. The class giggled and I grinned, thinking they were laughing at her, not me. What do you mean the right color, she asked, sounding genuinely confused and more than a bit annoyed. Now I became confused. Wasn't it obvious what I meant? I looked at my classmates for help, but now their expression had changed. They glared at me as if I suddenly had sprouted another head. The colors, the colors are the numbers. 
You know, like the two is pink. Well, of course, it isn't really this shade of pink. More like cotton candy pink. And the four is this baby blanket blue color. And I, I just figured it would be easier to do the math problems with the colors of the correct numbers, right? I pleaded with my classmates, my friends, to back me up. This time, when the class laughed, it didn't sound so friendly. I felt my cheeks burning. What are you telling me, Mia? Demanded his now clearly irate teacher. Numbers don't have colors. They simply have a shape and a numerical value. That's all. But they have all of those things, I whispered, my voice starting to fade away. Was I the only one in the world who saw things in color? Mrs. Lowe sent me to the principal. And then she made me be she made me clean the erasers for a week and apologize in front of the whole class for taking up their time with my nonsense. Those were her words. Pretty soon everyone forgot about that day. Everyone but me. I learned to guard my secret well, but now I'm 13. <coughs> everyone, everything is about to change and there's nothing I can do about it. So find out the adventures of Mia and all that she goes through because of her condition of seeing things in color. How many of you have ever heard of typhoid fever? Anyone heard of typhoid fever? This book is called Deadly, and this is by Julie Chibaro, and it's about the typhoid fever. What would happen if a person could carry a deadly disease without ever showing a symptom? That's what happened with typhoid fever in the 1900s. People were dying and they didn't know why. And biologists and doctors had to make a new discovery, how someone could carry a disease and not know that they were sick. The disease seems to follow you, doesn't it? Mr. Soper asked. Wouldn't you like to know why this is? She glanced quickly at her employer who seemed impatient and upset. I know why it is, she said. The city's full of sickness. Everywhere you look, there's people dropping with the typhoid and the crew. Taint no surprise, mister. People get sick all the time. Mr. Soper persisted. Yes, but the typhoid in particular seems to follow you, ma'am. If one is not careful, disease can enter the food one prepares, especially raw, uncooked food, like peach ice cream. The woman stopped slicing and looked up. Her, her employer interjected here. Mary is a cleanly person and a fine cook. Of course she washes. I wouldn't hire anyone who wasn't completely scrupulous in every way. This is a waste of time. I must get back to my wife. Please, let me show you to the door. Mr. Soper didn't move. Oniony tears watered Mary's eyes. She squinted them away and said to Mr. Soper in a bitter voice, you saying I ain't clean? We could solve this issue if you'd simply come to my office and give a sample of your fluids, Mr. Soper said. His voice softened as he got more frustrated with these stubborn people. My what? The cook asked just as quietly. Your fluids, he repeated. What in the world? She started to protest, and my chief interrupted. Your fluids, such as your blood, for example, will tell us if you carry disease. You want blood, she screeched, scaring the life out of me. I feared she'd completely lost her mind, shouting that way in front of the master of the house. Mary, please, her employer said. Mr. Soper said, your blood, yes. She took the knife in her hand and stabbed it into the chopping block with a high-pitched yell. I'll give you blood. Her employer turned to us. Mr. Soper, why don't you find the real reason for this typhoid, for God's sakes, instead of upsetting my staff? Mary struggled to remove the knife. The man waved his arms at us. Please, I'll have to ask you to leave. I have enough problems without your wild accusations. But all I ask for is one small sample. If you don't leave, I'll have to complain to the department. Mary hollered, get out of here, out, out with your foul ideas, go on. Her eyes rolled up, I could see the whites of them in her teeth. Please, ma'am, it's very important that we test you. She screeched and yanked the knife out of the block and started coming around. Mr. Soper turned on his heels, scooting me out of that house in front of him. And that was the last we spoke to her. This is the story of Prudence, who works for the health department, and they have to try to discover why typhoid fever is spreading across your city and killing so many people. And this is a story called Deadly. 
All right, I have a second book to share with you today. This is called Freak the Mighty by Rodman Philbrook. Great book. Um, two boys who are friends when they were toddlers. One is a big kid called Max, tall guy, and another is called Freak, and Freak is a smaller guy who has um, physical limitations, has crutches, has a leg brace, and they, uh, Max is living with his grandparents, uh, Freak is living with his mom, and they were friends as little kids, and then uh, circumstances had one moving to a different neighborhood, and now they're back in eighth grade and they're friends again. And the part I'm gonna share with you is where they're heading off into um, a summer night for fireworks, and there's a group of kids who are kind of like the gang members, bullies. It has a little flavor of outsiders to it. It's set in modern day. Um, and uh, Freak and Max are approached uh, by these um, uh, rough gang of kids. Hey you, Mutt and Jeff, Frankenstein and Igor. Don't look around, I'm talking to you, you knuckleheads. What is this, a freak show? I know that voice. Tony D, they call him Blade. He's at least 17, and he's already been to juvie court three, four times. I heard the guy cut a guy with a razor. He almost died, and everybody says, that's the best way to handle Tony D and his gang is, you avoid them. Cross the street, hide, whatever it takes. Yeah, you, he goes, and he's doing his hippity walk, strutting along. He's got these fancy, cool cowboy boots with metal toes. Yeah, Andre the Giant and the Dwarf. Hold on a sec, I want a word with you. Only the way he talks, he kind of goes like, I want a word with ya. Except it's bad enough having to listen to the creep. I don't want to have to spell the dumb way he talks. Anyhow, big mistake. We stop and we wait for Tony D, alias Bad News Blade. Got any dudes? He asks, pretending like he's friendly. He's a couple feet away but you can smell beer on his breath. Also, it kind of smells like he ate something dead. For instance, roadkill. But maybe that's just my imagination. Pay attention, Tony D says. I asked, do you get any? Freak, his chest all puffed out and his chin looks hard and he's looking right up at Tony D and he says, got any what? Tony D has put his hands on his hips and his punkster pals are trying to get closer, working through the crowd. He leans over Frank and he says, Boomers, you little freak. M80s. Maybe a rack of cherry bombs? Is that what's making that pocket of yours look crazy? Freak starts to hump himself away, trying to walk faster than he really can, which makes his leg brace bump against the ground. Come along, Maxwell, he says over his shoulder. Ignore the Cretan. Blade goes, hey, what? And he moves right in front of Freak. Wanna say that again, little Freak man? And Freak says, Cretan, C-R-E-T-I-N, defined as one who suffers from a mental deficiency. Hearing how little tiny freak is dissing the fearsome Tony D alias Blade. I can't help it. I didn't know it was gonna happen, but I did. I laughed out loud. Tony D is looking up at me and he's showing his white teeth and I swear they've been sharpened to look like vampire teeth. And I go, uh-oh and I start to get real cold inside, real icy, because I can see the blade is trying to make up his mind. Is he gonna fight me, or is he just gonna kill me real quick? So there you get a little flavor of meeting 
Max and Freak, and it's Max who's telling the story and their friendship, two unlikely, unlikely pals who are great friends together in Freak the Mighty. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Code Orange is the second book I'm going to share with you. Caroline B. Cooney is the author, and like the first book I shared, Eleventh Plague, and a few of the other ones, this one, the science component of it, focuses on a disease. Uh, smallpox, maybe some of you have heard of that. I'm sure you may have heard of chickenpox. Imagine chickenpox a hundred times worse than, uh, or smallpox a hundred times worse. Uh, it's, it's a horrible disease, similar to chickenpox there, uh, but uh, one that, uh, as you read through this, you'll learn and discover some details about it. Follows a kid, a high school kid named Maddie, or Mitty, my fault, Mitty there, and uh, he's kind of a smart kid, but a slacker. School's like the last thing on his list of things he wants to do, and he's kind of forced into a situation where his science grade really depends on how well he does on this research project he has to do, which is, just so happens to be, on infectious diseases, diseases. And uh, the section here I'll read uh, for you, let me see here, uh, is where he stumbles upon something mysterious in an envelope in an old book uh, on diseases as he's doing his research. So, Mitty didn't expect to be loved for his brain, uh, but he didn't want to be discarded for his total lack of brain either. So he did not put principles of contagious diseases back. That's the book. Uh, he sat cross-legged on the bare wood floor and leafed through the book. Flipping pages prior to reading took away some of the sting. First, choose a disease, he told himself. Faintly, he heard the sound of te the television and knew that his parents were watching something together. Since they had no television tastes in common, one of them was sacrificing for the other. Mitty would rather watch anything, even figure skating, than research an infectious disease he hadn't chosen yet in a book with no useful facts, so he considered heading for the media room. His fingers felt a raised place in the book, though. Not a lump, just a thicker area. Mitty turned pages, expecting a folded chart. Instead, he found an envelope. The envelope was rectangular, an odd size, maybe six inches long, two inches wide. It was mustard yellow, its color preserved by the darkness inside the book. It was labeled on one side with a fountain pen someone had written, scabs. VM Epidemic, 1902, Boston. The envelope was not and never had been sealed. It was closed with a thin string wound around a stiff paper button. Mitty undid the string and peered in, but the opening was narrow and he couldn't see exactly what was down there. He inverted the envelope over his hand and tapped. The contents slid out into his palm. The stuff really was scabs. So, uh, Code Orange, uh, choose this, and uh, you'll learn about uh, some of the horrors of chicken, uh, chicken pox, smallpox there, so. Okay. The second book that I'm going to talk to you about is Turnabout by Margaret Peterson Haddix. And had, did you ever see a video turn backwards so that it looks like something that happened reverses itself? Well, suppose you could reverse the life of a human being in a way that the person would go, grow younger again. This is exactly what happens in Turnabout to two women. Melly and Annie Beth lived regular lives in, two, in the year 2000 when they are 100 years old and ready to die. But they are selected to take part in a secret program that only 50 people are chosen for. The program is called Project Turnabout, and each person is given an injection which will affect their telomeres, which are part of their cells. By doing this, the shot reverses the aging process. At some point, when each person decides that they want to grow younger, they can receive, then they are done feeling that this is where they want to be, the age that they want to be, they can receive a second shot and it will stop the unaging. Then they will stay that age forever. But there are some unexpected snags in the process. It turns out that everyone who receives the second shot dies. So now the year is 2085. Melly and Annie Beth have unaged to their teens. They're living on their own and trying to keep their situation a secret but they also need to find someone to care for them. 
when they are too young to take care of themselves. Time is running out and the girls find themselves in a race against time with a scientific experiment gone wrong. And what will happen when they finally become infants again? This is Turnabout. Okay, the last book we're gonna talk about today is Maximum Ride by James Patterson. This actually is the first book in a series. So when we started using it, it was the only book in the series. So it gives you an idea how long we've been doing this. Um, this is the story of Max, Fang, Iggy, Nudge, the Gas Man, and Angel, who have grown up at the school. But the school isn't like the school that you attend. The school is a place where they do experiments on children. And these are cloned and um, genetic engineered children. And they have special powers that they have yet to discover. They don't know who their families are. They don't know where they belong. They just know they don't want to be at the school any longer. I've never been this far from the school before. I was totally lost. Still, my arms pumped by my sides. My feet crashed through the underbrush. My eyes scanned ahead anxiously through the half light. I could outrun them. I could find a clearing with enough space for me to, oh no, oh no, the unearthly baying of bloodhounds on the scent wailed through the trees, and I felt sick. I could outrun them, all of us could, even Angel, and she's only six, but none of us could outrun a big dog. Dogs, dogs, go away, let me live another day. They were getting closer. Dim light filtered in through the woods in front of me. A clearing? Please, please, a clearing could save me. I burst through the trees, chest heaving, a thin sheen of cold sweat on my skin. Yes, no, oh no, I skidded to a halt, my arms waving, my feet backpedaling in the rocky dirt. It wasn't a clearing, in front of me was a cliff, a sheer face of rock that dropped to an unseeable floor hundreds of feet below. In back of me were woods filled with drooling bloodhounds and psycho erasers with guns. Both options stank. The dogs were yelping excitedly. They'd found their prey. Moi. I looked over the deadly drop. There was no choice, really. If you were me, you'd have done the same thing. I closed my eyes, held out my arms, and let myself fall over the edge of the cliff. The erasers screamed angrily. The dogs barked hysterically. And then all I could hear was the sound of air rushing past me. It was so dang peaceful for a second, I smiled. Then, taking a deep breath, I unfurled my wings as hard and fast as I could. Thirteen feet across, <coughs> pale tan with white streaks and some freckly looking brown spots, they caught the air, and I was suddenly yanked upward hard as if a parachute had just opened. Yow! Note to self, no sudden unfurling. Wincing, I pushed downward with all my strength, then pulled my wings up, then pushed downward again. Oh my God, I was flying just like I'd always dreamed. The cliff floor, draped in shadow, receded beneath me. I laughed and surged upward, feeling the pull of my muscles, the air whistling through my secondary feathers, the breeze drying the sweat on my face. I soared up past the cliff edge, past the startled hounds and the furious erasers. One of them, hairy-faced, fangs dripping, raised his gun. A red dot of light appeared on my torn nightgown. Not today, you jerk, I thought, veering sharply west so the sun would be in his hate-crazed eyes. I'm not going to die today. This is the story of Max and her friends in Maximum Ride. Now, a lot of books, a lot of choices. And I want to share with you where, where the books are, and then we'll talk about how you're going to sign them out. If you're signing out, would you <coughs> if you're signing out Deadly, Mockingbird, Maximum Ride, Eleventh Plague, or Freak the Mighty, they're over on this table, and you're going to have to actually sign them out on the piece of paper. With the exception of Three of Eleventh Plague, if you take one of these and it has a library barcode on it, you're going to actually check it out from the library. Yeah. And there are four Freak the Mighties in the same way. If they don't have this on it and it's on this table, you have to sign it out on the sign-out sheet. If you're signing out, what do you have, Mr. D? Mango-shaped space, Al Capone, turnabout, code orange fever. That's it, right? That's it, yeah, so the other ones are all here, yeah. Those are all over here. 
those, you'll take a book, you'll come up here to sign out the book. You'll scan it right out. Okay? Those are your ten choices. Anyone have any questions about the books themselves? They're starting to. They're yeah. Starting to yeah, we're not going to do a dead run, so just sit down and relax. Anybody have any questions about the books themselves before we do sign ups? Cole. Okay, good question. I can tell you that if you're on the edge of your seat trying to get up, you're last. You're automatically last. The question was, what happens if you have a book in mind, ladies? What happens if you have a book in mind, and by the time you get up there, they're out of that book? Then you need to take another book. <laughs> it's that simple. They're okay. all great books. They are all great books, um, but you may not get that book. You might. Any other questions on the books before we go through how you're going to do this? Yeah. Uh, do we get them from Mr. Dubriel? You, yeah, you'll just choose whichever one. We're not going to have everybody move at once because it gets scary when that happens. Other questions before we have you go for books? All right, so let's do this. If you're in a rolling blue chair, get up and get a book. And I can check books out here also. Thank you. 